again. Father, we are grateful for this morning, grateful that you are the healer. Still are, always were, always will be. God, I'm so grateful for that. And uh, Lord, I have witnessed your healing in my life and in my family and in others. And Lord, uh, the greatest healing, of course, is the healing of our hearts spiritually, but also, uh, also Father, to see how you work in our lives in a way that physically we are lifted back up and we are praying God that you would do that in these situations that we've mentioned today we ask your work in these lives comfort and healing and uh, encouragement God in some cases when the sickness endures it can create so much anxiety and God we just pray that you'll just work through each and every one of those situations we thank you for your many blessings your love for us and God today as we Look at your scripture and look at your creation. I pray that we would begin to realize what a special, special God you are. How awesome and mighty and powerful. And, and uh, God, there is none like you. There is nothing like you. And you have opened your arms and invited us into an intimate relationship with you. How can we turn that down? What could mean more to us than to be able to be a part of the family of the creator? Uh, God, I just... Look at the times in which we live, and it's disconcerting as we look around us and, and see so many people blinded and some that we'll never see. But Lord, yet there are those that we still can reach, and I pray that we'll be uh, just vigilant in sharing Christ with people in these last days and tell them what an awesome God you are and that the truth is there in the Word, and we thank you that it is in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, we're going to look uh, for a couple of weeks at least at um, uh, eagles and um, I've over uh, eagle is just one of my f favorite critters you know I, I uh, love eagles and I've over the years uh, read about them and studied about them and and um, and so we're going to talk about a few of those things uh, they are mentioned often in the scriptures uh, I don't know if when you see something like this mentioned in the scriptures it, it motivates you to go study but when God brings something up uh, some things are only mentioned once uh, some things twice um, and yet every one of those things is important uh, I urge you all the time to study uh, reading through the Bible in a year read through the Bible one year just take a year and read through the scriptures and uh, you have to do two to three chapters a day that's all and you can go through the whole Bible in a year we put out on the table back there a read reading schedule and that reading schedule uh, it will take you at times through what we call uh, in the most boring parts of the Bible uh, which would be where guys anybody want to speak up where numbers uh, what first Chronicles Chronicles, that's exactly right. But you know, even though when I study First Chronicles and our Second Chronicles, and Chronicles naturally is just historical things, and it'll give a big long list of families and and how they relate. But but all those were given to us so that you could relate everything back to the Messiah and to Christ. And so every one of those things is important. And uh, God wouldn't have given to us if they're not important. And so even when I'm reading those, I like to take my time and look at them and look at them carefully. I've always, a few times, uh, thought I would name one of my kids or grandkids. Uh, some of those people, but my wife denied ever letting that happen. Because I, I always thought, uh, of course, I always wanted a kid named Magnus. Uh, I just thought Magnus, man, that's pretty powerful right there, you know. Uh, Magnus Magnuson. Does anybody know who Magnus Magnuson is? Yeah, world's strongest man, wasn't he, huh? And, uh, uh, oh. Oh, man more than once you're exactly right that's that's why he he looked up to me uh, and so <laughs> created that bond you know what I'm saying yeah but I love to as I'm studying the scriptures and you see certain scriptures or you see certain things to go back and and to look at them and look at them a little more carefully this is one of those eagles are mentioned 34 times in the scriptures uh, it's mentioned just four times in the New Testament and 30 times in the Old Testament and that's why 
uh, the Old Testament is so important? Why does God mention it? What's so important about an eagle? Why, why, what can we learn from eagles? Obviously, uh, there was much to learn from them. And in fact, in the Old Testament, because God mentioned it so many times, and they were so special to the people in the, the Old Testament, uh, in all, all different races and people, but the Jews particularly, uh, they would often speak about and look at eagles. They meant so much to them. And we can look back at those same things and understand more about ourselves and our relationships and what God intends for us. And so we're going to look at it. It'll take us probably a couple of weeks, maybe. I don't think it'll take us any more than a couple of weeks to, to do this study. Now, uh, we, you don't have any scriptures today. That's why the light's off, I suppose, because, and that's not, that's not Morgan's fault. That's my fault. And uh, I was still uh, deep in just praying about this and thinking about it and didn't get, it, get, didn't get her the scriptures. And so if you need them, I'll be glad to give them to you or we'll have them for you next week also. Hopefully we'll have them all done next week. So if you don't have a Bible, look to the person next to you that's going to have a Bible in a minute. We're going to be in John chapter 1. We're going to start in John chapter 1. And it says nothing really about eagles. But uh, that's where we're going to begin anyway. So... I'd like to pray again. Father, we pray that you'll just work in our hearts, that you'll open our understanding as we look at your creation, we look at your creatures. Now, Lord God, I, I pray that you'll just really open us up. Help me, Lord, to be able to explain all that you've given me over the years of, of just praying and looking at your creation. Uh, God, it's just so vast and so awesome. And uh, it teaches us so much about you. I, I'm so sorry, God, that in our world we live in today, we live among so many people, the majority of people, who deny that you created anything. And that's just unbelievable to me. I, as I was studying this again, and Cheryl and I were talking about it, you know, Lord, on the way down here, and just how can anybody see these things? And think it just is all by chance. They're fools. That's what the Bible says. They're fools. And God, I don't say that to indict them. I say that in a broken heart. We're the people who know and must teach them the truth. And so God, I just pray that you will really enlighten us with your word. That we would understand the importance of believing every word, every jot, every tittle, everything that's written here is critically important. And God, I pray that we would have a diet every day of these scriptures. That it would be something that we would just devour every single day. Even if it seems dry and pointless, God, you will minister to us through this word. And I pray that it would motivate us to do just that. May we all have a desire to study your word and read through it every year. Just to be reminded over and over of your greatness. Lord, thank you for loving us. And we ask now that you just empower this word in a special way. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, lately I've been watching and reading as I read um, articles and, and look at things, I'm, I'm uh, excited about the fact that a lot of people who uh, even aren't believers yet, they're not Christians, um, but more and more and more we have people, scientists, who are coming forward and saying, we can no longer accept evolution. And these are people who are steeped in it who have believed it thoroughly. And they say now with all the developments that we see uh, biologically when we talk about um, uh, DNA, for an example, in order for DNA to change, in order to cause enough change to, to go from one type of creation, in other words, to go from a, um, well, from a fish to a bird to a monkey to a human being or whatever, it would take more than billions of years. It would take more than trillions of years. And even at that, I read one guy who was, had been an avowed atheist, did not believe in God, who wrote and said that if you could take one molecule 
and put it out into space. Shoot it out into space as far as it can go and turn it loose. And then engage everybody possible to go out and find that one molecule. That would be almost, not quite, but almost how possible it would be to change someone's DNA that much. And so for someone to go from one creature to another creature just because of DNA, it's an impossibility. And what he wrote was, the thing that caught my eye was, if that's the case, this is called a DNA code. There is no code in the world that wasn't written by somebody. Who wrote that code? That's what he said. Somebody, there had to be intelligent design to write a code so detailed that you couldn't change it. And he said, it got me to thinking, maybe there is a God. You see, God said that. That there is a God. And he told us you know what, Charlie, you know, I know you pretty well. Charlie, we're, we're pretty good friends. If God was to sit down and say, Charlie, I want to explain to you creation. Six words into that, you'd be out in the middle of the meadow somewhere, wouldn't you? I mean, it would be over. We would not be able to get the small. So all he had to do was just say, I did it. Just believe it. Right? And he uses the creation to teach us about life. I, my kids were growing up. I was telling somebody the other day, uh, Charlie, I think, and I were talking about maybe uh, the other Charlie. Um, Charlie Napier and I were talking about just going out in the woods and camping and spending time with your kids as you're out walking through the woods. And I used to take that opportunity as we would go through words, woods and point out what God had done. And things that I had read in Scripture and quote to them Scripture that had talked about things in the trees or things in the stars or, or things that God had created when we would see birds and eagles and fish and things like that. To be able to explain, here's what God said about it. It takes a little bit of effort to learn how to do that. But that's exactly what God says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, that you and I are to walk out the door of our house and begin to explain on our walks with our kids everything that there is to know about God. The reason we can't do that is because we don't know anything about God, because we haven't taken any time to find out anything about God. And yet this book is the only translation, the only book, the only thing that we have that can explain God clearly. And then God gives us, as we read this, understanding. I find it amazing as I'm reading through uh, uh, just an article or something, and I'll think to myself as I'm going through it, man, that's just unbelievable. And I'll relate some scripture to it that God has given me at some point, place, and time over the last 40 years. That's how God does it. That's how God opens our understanding. And so we need every book of the Bible. If you believe you don't need the Old Testament, I hope by the time we're done with the next series that we're going to go through, which could take years, I have no idea, but we're going to study the Old Testament. We're going to study the Old Testa Testament prophets. We'll look at how God did miracles. We won't know how he did them, but we'll see the miracles that God did. We'll look at his creation. God mentions things over and over like eagles. And we'll see what he wants us to learn about those things from the scriptures. And from observation of those animals. It's amazing. It's amazing. I sat down last night. And just was sitting, and Cheryl, I don't remember what she was doing. We'd, we had a, uh, we have a throwdown every year uh, out at the Sodro clans, uh, Adrian and Emily's usually. Uh, we call it, uh, you all would call it a wiffle ball game. We call it World War IV sometimes. It's just, it's brutal, it's ugly. Uh, we usually eat dinner before because afterwards nobody can get up. I mean, it's just, it's pretty bad. Uh, the get -together. We used to, we had the Navy SEALs come a couple times. And they've did not desired ever. They've denied that they were there and said they'd never be back because that was the most brutal thing they'd ever seen in their life. Is when we get together to play wiffle ball. So last night after wiffle ball, Cheryl was getting pictures of the wiffle ball games and things that were going on, and I'm studying. and And as I'm studying, I got this video playing, and she comes and said, "What are you listening to?" And there's there's screech screech, and I said, "Look at this." And these videos of eagles and what they were doing, and it's just amazing. 
as you watch these things unfold you how God created God created and put inside these you'll see people talk about well it's just their instinct where do you get your instinct you know I, I related to you sitting on the beach last year and watching these little sandpipers is what we'd call them. I gave you the, the big time name, but, but I watched these little birds just run up and down. They're real, they're, they're real protective of their territory and they run up and down that water and they poke around and they hoo, 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 here and they run back whenever somebody comes in their territory and they run at them and just fuss at them and then they go back. And, and those little birds down there in Destin, Florida, on a specific day almost, lift up, take it off, and they mate and they bear their eggs, their babies, up in the Arctic. And then when it comes time for cold weather, they come down here to feed and get strength so they can go back. Isn't it amazing how they find their way back every year to the same place? And they go back to the same place that they were born, where they nested every year, every year? That's just, that's some of the dumbest luck you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> If I were to give each of you a place to go, this whole crew couldn't get to the same place at the same time without GPS or something. Am I right? It's God. That's all you got to tell people. Look, look what God did. If we would just start seasoning, seasoning our speech with a little bit of salt and make people begin to think there's something special about all this. It's all about God. It's for His glory. That's what this is. And so when people sit and deny that God created anything, I think that must upset God. You see, we can do something. We can do a painting or something. And we want people to look at it and say, ooh, wow, that's something. This guy took these things and molded them together and created this painting or sculpture or whatever it is. And, and we want to do that and hang it up and pe be people be proud of that. Imagine taking absolutely nothing. 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 Not air. Not gas. Nothing. And creating everything from nothing. And then we look at him and say, you didn't do that. I would think that would upset him. I would think he wouldn't want anything to do with people like that. Wouldn't you? And we wonder why God left the schools. And we wonder why God left America. I can tell you why. You don't want him. And he never goes where he's not wanted. Isn't that amazing? John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. Now, of course, what they're talking about here is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, Jesus Christ, and the Word, Jesus Christ, was with God. And the Word, Jesus Christ, was God. What did we just learn? Jesus is God. Jesus is God. John White figured that out. And if rest... <laughs> huh? Right, John? Yeah, you have, haven't you? Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same, this very same, was in the beginning with God. He was there with God because He was God. And then it says, all things. Tell me, what would that encompass? All things, everything, all things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. What can we conclude? Jesus made everything. Yeah! Right now I'm going to say this, and this is not going to be popular. God created everyone sitting in this room. And God has never, ever, ever, nor will ever, ever, ever make a mistake. And so when people stand up and say, 
Well, I know my birth certificate says that I'm a, a feller, but I was actually a woman. Amen. You have spit in the face of God. Amen. Amen. And listen, I, I feel sorry for my daughter Amanda and Alec Billings teaching the public school system. And I don't know some of the rest of you do, I suppose. I, I wouldn't last. I wouldn't last a week. I wouldn't last probably a day. <laughs> Alec's just starting over at Franklin. Right, Franklin? Yeah. Now, Alec would never have been my teacher because he teaches calculus. <laughs> no, no. Earth science, uh, physics, and... ICP, so physics and chemistry. Physics and chemistry. All right, right there. I learned how to blow things up in chemistry. Just that, that was kind of it. Hey guys. All right, all right. <laughs> they were just stretching. Uh, now he probably wouldn't have been my teacher because I probably wouldn't have been in any of them classes, you know. Um, but I can't imagine if they ever said to me, "Now this guy here, I know, I know, but he says she's a she." I, I would not make that. I'm sorry, I just could not. Because every time I did it, I would feel like I was insulting God. What's that? I know it's in the healthcare system. It is. It's absolutely everywhere. And, 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 and I, I'm telling you what, I suspect it won't be long before they're going to walk in someday and say, you can't do that anymore in the pulpit. And that will be when I'm gone. Because I will not insult God. When God said, this is what I did, that I created all things and I do everything perfectly, He absolutely meant that. Look at uh, Colossians 1, 16. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, verse one, chapter 1, verse 16. Now here, if you go back, we're going to go back and look at all the scripture from the beginning of chapter 1 down through this point. Um, but in this letter that was written to the church of Colossae, it's written about the preeminence and the power and the presence and the ma majesty of Jesus Christ. And it is pointing to these people in Colossae the fact that Jesus Christ, who we have met, we have handled, we know, we have seen, we have heard, this Jesus Christ is God. It says in verse 15, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by Him, Jesus Christ, were all things created. All of the things that are in heaven... Or the heavens, the stars, everything that you see when you look into the sky and everything that you can't see that's beyond the skies. All of those things that are in heaven, all of those things that are in earth or upon the earth or inside of the earth, all of the things that are visible, everything that is invisible, whether they are thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, Powers, all things, including Satan himself, were created by Jesus Christ. And they were created for Jesus Christ. That's what it says. They were created by him and they were created for him. And he, Christ, is before all things and by... And by Jesus Christ, by Him, all things consist. We've done this before, but we're going to do it once again. I want all of you, on the count of three, to take a deep breath, okay? All right, we're going to do this on the count of three. If, if you have trouble getting there, our professor will help you get to three, all right? Okay, on the count of three, I want you to take a deep breath of air, okay? One, two, three. What do you think? Thank you, Jesus. By Him, all things consist. 
Every time you take a draw of air, thank you, Jesus. Because if it weren't for him, you wouldn't be here right now. You exist. You consist. You continue on because of Jesus Christ. You don't have to believe it. But it's so. That's what it says. Verse 18 then says this. And Christ, well, he's the head of the body, the church. He's the head of the church. Who is the beginning? He is the beginning. He's the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence. That he might be the boss. Look at Luke chapter 12 verse 6. Luke 12 verse 6. Jesus Christ one day spoke this. He was making a point. He was talking about people who are fearful. People who um, worry about the culture around them. People who worry about people who are in authority around them. People who are afraid uh, of whatever they're afraid of. Um, we on Wednesday night, a lot of times we'll talk about why do you not share Jesus Christ with somebody? And what we have people say is, we don't know what to say. Uh, we might say the wrong things. We might this, we might that. You know what all that is? It's called fear. Scriptures teach us that God didn't give you the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and clear thinking. That's what he teaches us. And so we are ashamed of Christ. You want to know the real truth? You don't tell people about Jesus Christ because you're ashamed of Jesus Christ, who gave you the air to breathe, that keeps the blood coursing through your veins. You're ashamed of Jesus Christ. I can't explain everything about my wife, but I'll be glad to tell you about my wife anytime, everything I know. I'll be glad to tell you what I know about the grass that's green. I'll be glad to tell you about eagles in just a little bit. I don't know everything there is to know about eagles. I don't know everything there is to know about anything. I know very little that there is to know about everything. But I'll be glad to help and you by telling you what I do know. Do not tell me. That you're embarrassed. That you don't know what to say. That you're fearful. You are ashamed of Jesus Christ. Do you know why I can say that? Because that's exactly what he said. You're ashamed of me and my words. He says right here. I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that have no more that they can do. I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him. After which he hath, after which after he hath killed, then has the power to cast into hell. Yeah, that's he said. I'll tell you this. That's 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 who you need to fear. Fear him. And then he says this as a word of encouragement to all of us: Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? Sparrows were the bottom of the rung, as far as they were concerned in the fowl. They were just not where they were everywhere. You guys have sparrows at home? You ever seen sparrows at your house? I, I, I put up this birdhouse. Cheryl wanted to put up a birdhouse. And it was supposed to be for, oh, was it for purple martins. I said, Cheryl, we're not, not going to get purple martins in this neighborhood. You know, you've got to be out in the country. But she said, no, let's try. We'll see. What. So I go and get a purple martin house and I put it all together and I concrete the pole in the ground and I get it up in the air. And I mean, it's just up there. And it was in purple martin season. Okay. I mean, this is when you catch your purple martins. Okay. And, and we're doing everything. I'm putting purple martins up on top of the bird house to draw the purple martins into the and you know I did everything that except purple martins only I, I mean that's the only thing I didn't put on that thing was purple martins only and in a day it's full of sparrows I mean sparrows got stuff hanging out of their houses and I mean it's just sparrows man sparrows I went out to Cheryl and I said look well we'll clean it out start over I said and then there'll just be more sparrows just leave it alone 
So for years, we've had the most expensive sparrow condo in the neighborhood, right there, okay? <laughs> Sparrows. He says, are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? Which, let me tell you what, a farthing was nothing, okay? And not one of those sparrows is ever forgotten before God. God knows where every hair of my head is right now. Somewhere else, I'm sure. Because it says, But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. You see, that's how valuable you are. That's how amazing this God is. He knows every hair that you've ever had on your head. He knows where every hair you ever had on your head is right now. He knows them. He knows how many, how many. When you go to the beach and you stand on the seashore and I look and I'll go and I used to tell my kids, look at this. Go down there and grab a handful of sand. How many are there? How many grains of sand? Oh, Dad, I, there's no way to know. But fellas, God knows every sand on every seashore, how many there are. He knows where every one of them is. If you take one home with you, one grain of sand, he'll know that you moved that grain of sand from Florida to Greenwood, and he'll know exactly where it is. What kind of God is that? Do your, do your family members know about that God? What an awesome God He is. Or are you ashamed of Him? You wouldn't know exactly what to say. Look at Revelation 14. That scripture teaches us that not only does God know, He loves. That's the amazing part, isn't it? He knows and He loves. He loves us. This is the last known message that's preached before the end times. Listen carefully. The last known message in this, written in the scripture. This is the last message that is preached from God's throne in the end times. This is before God sends the final judgments. This is the last chance. This is the last time the message is going to be dispersed. Revelation chapter 14, look at verse 6. It says, And I saw this other angel flying in the midst of heaven. And so he says, I look and I see an angel flying across heaven. And this angel has the everlasting gospel. What's the gospel? The good news. And the gospel, a few weeks ago, we talked about the gospel. Do you remember what the gospel is? Death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. Jesus Christ preached the gospel. The apostles preached the gospel. They started the church by preaching the gospel. They wrote the scriptures and finished the scriptures preaching the gospel. And you and I can't get the fact that we can't go to somebody and say, Hey, Alec, you know what, dude? Jesus Christ came, lived on this earth. He died. He was crucified on that cross. He was buried in a grave. And then he rose all by himself. You know what that is? That's the gospel. How hard was that? Can you get that? I think so. Oh, yeah. I yeah, I may have to repeat it. You got that? So the gospel, last message priests, the everlasting gospel. Don't make me sick by thinking you can't do that because I know you can. And so this angel is given instructions. God leans over and he says, here, Gabriel, I want you to take one last message. Gabriel was a guy who presented the, the messages, most of the messages that we saw on earth. I don't know if it's Gabriel, but it was another angel. He flew all across heavens, 
having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. And so he circled the globe. And all this is being caught on all of the networks that haven't been destroyed yet. And they're seeing this angel go across the skies. And it's being televised to every home. And every home that doesn't have a TV, the angel will make a way past that house to make sure that everybody hears one more time. It says he's speaking to every nation, every kindred, and every tongue, and every person. So the message goes to absolutely everyone. One more time. And he says this. With a loud voice. Fear God. And give glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment is come and worship Him. That what? Made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. What's the message? The gospel and the fact that he's the creator. And in America today and all around this world today, we have churches. I sit down with people that I know that are in church that are, air quote, Christians saying to me, it doesn't matter whether God used evolution to create the world. Oh. Really? Really? Billions of years. Billions of years. And nothing became someone over billions of years. It doesn't matter that God said very clearly in six days. In six days. Six 24-hour periods. The same word for day from the beginning of the Scriptures to the end of the Scriptures. They use one word for the word day. And that means one 24-hour period of time. How do we get millions of years out of six days? We do it by denying the truth of God. Sam Sodro, when they ask you at school this year something about that million year business I expect you to continue because you've done it in the past tell them you're full of it and if they don't believe it tell them to call me and I'll tell them the same thing six days you just point them to the scripture that says Genesis chapter 1 this is what God did in six days and he, and he polished off man in less than a half a day right When I look at the scriptures, I can't help but think about how awesome God is. Young eagles, young eagles are prepared by God. If he created all things, did he create every eagle? God created every eagle that there is. And God makes no mistakes. And so God created all of the young eagles that we see. He uses their parents to train them. That's something that's being forgotten today. We hire out somebody to take care of training our youngins. Eagles train their own offspring. God uses instinct, wisdom that he puts in their hearts and in their minds. And what he puts inside of them, and you and I need to remember this, is simply everything that he puts in, in them is to accomplish everything that he has planned for them. God puts inside of them everything that, that requires us to know and understand his purpose for what he created us for. That's important you know that. 
that before the foundation of the world, that's what the scripture says, before you were ever born, before you were ever thought about, before the foundation of the world, remember this, when you are asked about it, and you should be, God knew me. He knew you before he created anything. Jack and Vivian Sodro, my parents, had little to do with me. Other than training me up after God delivered me to their hands. You know, you many might not believe that I was a gift of God to my mom and dad, right? <laughs> Especially my brothers and sisters wouldn't believe that, but that's an absolute fact. And so when somebody says, it's fine for me to murder that baby that had been conceived in the mind of God, well, I'm sorry. Once again, I will not spit in the face of God. That is God's. And I can take you to the scripture, if you want to go there, that says all of those children are mine. They belong to me. And what a great insult it is for us to say it's okay. It's okay. To destroy them. Those are God's children. Just like these little eagles. These eaglets. They belong to God. And God entrusts them to their parents. For their parents to raise up and train. Here's how kind of some of this works. Young male eagles, when they're about eight or nine months old, will leave their home. And when they leave their home, they've been trained to fly and find a new territory. Their new territory is what they call nesting ranges. And you'll go out into the nesting range, which is a nesting range. You're going to build your nest. You have about 50 to 100 acres around your property where you're building your nest that belongs to you. It's yours. Don't come into your my 100 acres, okay? Now, they have a hunting territory that's far larger than that. They will hunt. Their area that they consider to be their hunting area is about 62 hundredths of a, of a mile to about one and a quarter miles. So just three quarters of a mile to about a, a mile and a quarter. That's the area that they will within their nest. You'll see them venture out further and, and fly around, but that's their area. That's their territory. And the eagles, they won't cross over into somebody else's territory. If you establish that as your territory, and they will share, if I leave my 100 acres, they will share outside that 100 acres with another guy who's also in that same territory. They will allow hunting from one neighbor to the next. Eagles will. But that 100 to 50 to 100 acres is theirs right there. That belongs to them. And they fiercely protect it. It belongs to them. You dare not come near their airy, their nest, the place where they live. Look at Jeremiah chapter 49, verse 16. Jeremiah 49, 16. <clears throat> Jeremiah 49, 16 says this, Thy terribleness hath deceived thee, and the pride of thine heart. O thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, that holds the height of the hill, though thou shouldst make thy nest as high as the eagle, I will bring thee down from thence, saith the Lord. Eagles' nests are built as high as possible. Just like it describes in the scripture. They will find the highest hill. They will find the highest rocks. They will find the highest place. And that's where they will go. And they will fly up. And they will begin to establish their nest. They call their nest Aries. By doing that, that protects them from predators. Most predators will not go nearly that high. Other birds will not fly as high as eagles fly, as we'll see as we study it. From their height of where that they build this nest, 
they have a greater visibility of prey. Not just predators, but prey. And actually, most predators become prey, especially if they get into their territory. From that height, it gives them the ability. The eagle's eye is larger than the human eyeball. Did you know that? An eagle's eyeball is almost 25% larger than a human's eyeball. Their eye also has six times the ability in sharpness than a human eye. They're able to see six times sharper than you and I can. They can see rabbits and other prey over one mile. Just looking. From a mile away. Now, you and I can see uh, far less than that. In other words, if, uh, the, the ability for them to see, if you were to take a quarter and throw it out in the grass, just a quarter, and throw it out in the grass, an eagle can see that quarter clearly. If you'll ask them, they'll give you the date off of it, Charlie. But they can see that quarter clearly from 200 yards. You and I can't see it after 35 yards. You might. I bet you I couldn't see it at 25 yards or 15 probably, but most people can see it at 25. 25 to 35 yards. That's the kind of eyesight that they have. They need that eyesight to protect their family. They need that eyesight to take care of their family and to provide for their family. There are over 60, I don't know if you knew this, there are over 60 types of eagles. Did you know that? Now, in North America, we have two. We have the bald eagle and we have the golden eagle. And those are really the only two. Those are the two largest, are those two. And they're, in fact, the two largest birds, other than maybe a condor, they're the two largest birds that there are. But there are all kinds of eagles. There are eagles they call sea eagles that live on the coast. There are eagles that live in the dense forests of South America. And they live up in the trees and they get up in the tops of the trees and they reach their prey down on the floors. And I read an article about a scientist, these scientists writing about these eagles. They're smaller and their wingspan is not nearly as wide as the golden eagle or the bald eagle that we know. And what this guy says is, over time, they have evolved from having a seven foot wingspan or an eight foot wingspan like the other eagles. They've evolved down to a much smaller wingspan because they have to get their prey inside of there. And I looked at it and I think, what? Yeah, you see, they evolved. They got smaller so they could. Wonder how many million died trying to get smaller wings so finally one of them stood up and said you know what these wings are killing us we got to get rid of these wings let's shrink our wings hello or maybe God created forest eagles and put them there you think that could be a possibility he created the forest and the forest eagles and put them there to catch their prey oh man that would be too weird that would just be stupid The nest height, having the nest so high, gives them the ability to be able to not only see the prey, but leave their nest and reach a speed between 75 and 100 miles per hour to grab that prey and take it back to their nest. Now, catching those things, their prey, is an amazing thing. We're not going to have time to do that today. But I want to tell you this one thing, and then we'll talk more about it next time. We're going to talk more about their prey. We're going to talk about how amazing and the scripture that goes with all of this that God teaches us, how they build their nest, what they do is amazing. But I want to tell you how they mate just quickly. We'll go into it in more detail. Because I, Josie's here. Josie and I want you to 
to remember this. This is how you find a mate, okay? That stuff that you've been thinking, nah, put it away. Female eagles start the process. We'll go how they get to this point later on. But they, they're the ones, and it's the way it always is, chicks picking up dudes, you know what I'm saying? And so... <laughs> You'll also be pleased to know that the female's 25% larger than the male. Did you know that? And I'll give you all the statistics later, but they're 25% larger and heavier than the male. And so the female, she'll fly over. She sees this guy. This male has built this nest. Nice home. And so she flies by, sees the home, says, that's cool. I like that place. It's laid out right. She flies by. She said, I'm going to date that guy. So she goes up to the trees and she gets a stick. She catches the stick, puts it in her talons. She flies down within reach of his nest and she drops that stick. As that stick begins to plummet to the ground, he looks up, says, not bad. And he jumps out of his nest. He races down, grabs the stick picks it back up before it hits the ground and carries it back and puts it in his nest. She goes and observes. She watches that. She goes around, grabs a bigger stick, flies by with the bigger stick and drops it in front of this guy. He's already interested, right? He jumps out of his nest, chases that big stick toward the ground, grabs it before it hits the ground, flies back and puts it in his nest. This goes on all day long. Bigger stick, bigger stick, bigger stick, until she gets a stick that is so large she can barely lift it. Remember, she's 25% bigger than he is. This stick is a log. It probably weighs at least 15 pounds, 12 to 15 pounds. She's carrying a 12 to 15 pound log. She flies up, drops that log. The male eagle jumps out of that nest, flies down at 100 miles an hour to grab that log before it hits the ground. Snatches that log with his talons, flies back up and places that log, that log, in his nest. Remember this, Josie. If that guy can't pick up a log bigger than you and climb a tree with it, he ain't for you. You got that? Forget about it. Now there's a reason for that. She's 25% bigger than the male. She wants to know that this mate will take for, take care of, and provide for the eaglets. And so she picks a log bigger than herself to see his commitment to risk his life to collect that log before it hits the ground and then carry it safely back home and put it in its nest. And when she sees his commitment... And his ability, she then will join him in the nest with the sticks that she's delivered to him to test his willingness to be her mate. It's amazing. It's amazing how God puts that inside of a man to take care of his wife and his children. And when that's not there, and it's not, sadly, in this nation, in the world in which we live, there is something seriously wrong. Those illustrations that God has given us are not only being ignored, they're not even being taught. And God writes that throughout His Scriptures. The Bible teaches us that a man that won't care for his family, only two times God uses this word in the entire Bible. If a man won't take care of those that are his own, He's worse than an infidel. The word infidel is only used twice in the Bible. It's one of the most disgusting words that you can ever hear. If a man won't take care of what he produces, he's worse than the worst. Come on, guys. Time to step up. And it's not about the beans you put on the table. It's about the love you put in their heart. That's what God's teaching.
the lessons that he gives, how much will that eagle, that male eagle, love the offspring that he produces with that eagle, that female? If he will not risk his life, if he will not give all he has, she wants no part of him. And that ought to be the case for all of us. The one who has done all for me, who risked his life, who laid down his life, what else? What else does he have to do before you begin to love like you should? He created you. He, he cons you consist because of him. And he plans, plans and prepares for you a future home. What else do you want? What else do you have to do to convince you of his love and his superiority than what he's already done? Father, I thank you for your creation. I thank you for what we can learn and what we can see that you've given us. To watch how the eagle builds his nest. To watch how he mates. To watch the love affair between a male eagle and a female eagle that bond for life. One mate for all of their life until death does them part and then normally they never ever mate again. No matter what. God, you give us these illustrations in Scripture to tell us this is what I intend. Forgive us, God, for insulting you. Forgive us for ignoring you. Forgive us for being so full of pride that we're embarrassed by you. God, I am so sorry. And I pray that you would teach us to love like you love. To serve, to spread the gospel until you come to take us home. God, thank you. Thank you for your creation. Thank you for your creatures. But God, may we never worship them. May we just always worship you, the Creator. In Christ's name, amen.